I'm Rick, the Batman GM. I am your GM, your game master, for the day. I have 40 years of experience. I began playing when I was 12 years old, and my experience runs from old school, old Dungeons and Dragons, through Star Wars and Battletech, Shadowrun, and a slew of others. It's always been my philosophy that role-playing games and tabletop board games, gaming as a social medium is a great way for all walks of life to come together and enjoy camaraderie and exploring and stepping out of our comfort zone, if you will. So this is your place at the table. I'm going to take you back here, my friends, to the 80s, late 70s, early 80s. This was a time before social media. The, the Internet barely existed. It was a concept. It was highly expensive. A very few people uh, got into uh, CompuServe, and I, I'm drawing a blank on the system before that. I know when I joined CompuServe, it cost almost $3 a uh, a uh, hour to access the internet and then uh, later it was uh, American Online and it was two dollars an hour and I, I can remember one bill in 94 that ran me almost eight hundred dollars and man I really <laughs> got chewed out by the white for that one and it wasn't shortly after that that they went to flat rate which was like manna from heaven for a lot of us uh, internet addicted individuals because it was ironic I broke my knee at the same time uh, this thing went uh, internet went uh, flat rate so for $30 a month I had basically unlimited and it was from that point on that we see social media change the the gaming hobby as we know it prior to that date prior to that date uh, you either if you wanted to connect with people that were in the hobby you either met them at a local convention if you could if you had one you met them at your local game store or they were friends and associates that you basically hunted down or connected with on a personal level uh, the few multimedia ex exceptions of that time were the magazines uh, things like dragon and dungeon magazine for example uh, we have you know, here's another example, Stardate, and uh, here's one for, for MechWarrior Battletech, uh, Battle Technology. I truly love these. I collected as many of them at the time as I could get, and one of the things I loved about this particular new zine, if you will, is everything in it is written as if you were there. It's written to you from the timeline and the game world setting, so there's nothing real world about this. That's just an example. Uh, magazines like this was more about science fiction and novels and TV, but occasionally material for games and stuff would pop up in here. Uh, you'd get a few odds and ends here and there, and it was through magazines like this that we were able to get our own version of homebrew stuff and that we could add to existing material that we had, especially since our existing material in those days was fairly limited. Uh, so, when uh, I heard about uh, the Role Player Gaming Association, which I have a tendency to butcher this when I when I mention it in my other videos, I often call it the RPGN. It's it is the RPGA. I got a bunch of these cards somewhere because I ran into ran into them, and uh, you get issued. Uh, basically four of these magazines a year they come out uh, quarterly and each magazine is a in this case they call them a news zine that you know flat out says a news zine it caters specifically to uh, the Dungeons and Dragons AD&D &D, created by TSR and was uh, or in the play world mostly was Forgotten Realms uh, they actually created a city in Forgotten Realms called the Living City. There's references throughout the magazines and uh, to this particular entity and it was a way for players, the fans, fan base to interact with uh, the game in a limited level compared compared to what we can do and contribute now. Uh, it's just apples and oranges, right? One of the things that you had is, as a member was it, you had you could form local chapters, which I was involved in forming one in Des Moines. It lasted for about 10 years. Uh, you can participate in convention. Any convention you can get to, you can. they'll usually f would find somebody running an RPGA sanctioned uh, 
event or two or whatever. And if you participated, you got points either as a game master or as a player, and they would be ranked in the in the uh, uh, new zine and in the uh, the club, if you will. And the magazines themselves. This was our access to player-based fan service, uh, fan-based material, uh, your, what you consider homebrew today, and other things that potentially would show up later in uh, various supplements for, for Dungeons and Dragons. The thing here was that uh, it wasn't by no means guaranteed that you were going to see this stuff in uh, future supplements, but uh, TSR mined the material from this pretty heavily. I, I, I guarantee that. And one of the advantages, you know, of having these things is the fact that you have this little nice section here called the classifieds. This allowed you to have a social media prior to the internet that we have today. And if you want, you could run ads looking for gamers. You know, here's the attention gamers, Massachusetts area, interested in forming an RPGA network club, the Fantasy Gamers uh, Guild in the Northwest Massachusetts area. Send an SASE to Costa, blah, blah, blah. You see, you didn't send an email, you didn't see a text. We sent an old snail mail, and that's how we connected. And we also would find out that uh, about conventions and other groups that have formed in the region. Then back page was just that conventions, and then there were and some of these issues have communications between uh, player groups and or individuals that are looking for pen pals, and you know the the concept of play by post is actually very old. It is the it in the early days it was the second only way to play. You either played with a local group, you got some friends together or some associates who wanted to play and had a session or a series of sessions. The only other option you had was to find a pen pal of sorts or several and run a campaign through the mail. And you talk about, people com complain about play by post. Well it's so slow. I grant you it is slow. There's no getting around that. But you try playing it through the mail. They didn't call it. They don't call it snail mail for a reason. If you know, even if your buddies at just the other side of the state, it could take a week, a couple days for it to get there, a day or two for them to respond, a couple days for it to come back. You see, the same thing happened by the the player play by mail game system. So if you played uh, played by like. Flying Buffalo has a number of game systems, and I played several of them. Uh, you turn in your turn sheet, and it could be a couple weeks, it could be a month, depending on which venue you chose to play in. And each venue, the faster, you know, the, I think the quickest turnaround was supposed to be 10 days or a week, and you paid through the nose for that service because you're paying for somebody at the other end to expedite your turn and everybody else that's in your classification or group. So, now, I have to make an amendum because the RPG A new zine also covered more than just D&D because obviously I'm looking at Recalled to Life in the Marvel Universe, Roll for Surprise, but it's a different version of Dungeon or Dragon Magazine, and you see the moisture's gotten to it a little bit, and you find little short one-offs, uh, information on new possible creature, creatures and people, uh, towns. Most of this stuff was produced by players, uh, people like me and you, you, that's right, you, you would do this and you would send your stuff in as opposed to waving it all over our social media and our video response channels and, and asking and, and people's opinions on it. You would send it in and hope that you would be picked for the, one of the future issues. And it was a, a, a minor to big thing. I mean, this was a chance to see your stuff published to some degree. Here's a Gamma World game adventure. The Living City. Critical hit. Critical hit. Does that sound familiar to anybody? It's not a new thing. I'm just saying. Arcane, you know, Arcana Academia. It's because of things like this. For some of us older hats, who when we think of things like uh, uh, how the rule mechanics work and are applied to our games to create a story, that we develop such a fondness for these things because we have loads and loads of stuff like this to 
have built upon and and you know it's just talking about how to enhance things and we're talking here that from the dungeoner survival guide combat rolls on the ground proficiencies climbing walls you know survival or magic items potions things that that you can that eventually found their way in some form or another into later editions of game material or other games altogether and my mother has a term it's not plagiarism either it's called creative license or uh, creative borrowing the fact of the matter is by definition every work ever constructed is a is plagiarized and just a minute just a minute I know you're gonna argue with me there's always somebody out there that wants to argue with the fat man or not argue with the fat man you know what because don't care don't care here's the thing right if you are a fan of a certain genre right and you become such a fan that you want to contribute so if you're going to write a book do you think honestly think Stephen King invented the horror thriller I'm sorry but he didn't you can go back and look through lots and lots and lots of books and compendiums of, of short stories from back in the day from the 30s and the 20s and even earlier that were based off of thriller stuff so all all he did was is he grew up reading and writing this stuff he got a thing for it and then he started creating his own so he didn't outright plagiarize he didn't pick up somebody else's work and copy it verbatim but he gained a lot of knowledge and information and ideas and concepts and ways to pursue things from other people's stuff and it's not plagiarism it isn't plagiarism this is how we work and this is how we learn and this is how we improve on things that we understand it's no different in the gaming industry right so when you see a lot of people who are self-publishing material today uh, creating their own game systems and their own game companies you know there's a there's a common under under tow thread that occasionally crops up that somehow or another they've got a connection to the inside that somebody's giving them a foot up well that might be true after the fact but most of the work they did they worked they did it hard work but yeah is how many clones of AD and D are there be truthful and honest when I ask that question how many clones and you make the argument that okay Pathfinder is distinctly different from AD and D absolutely right it's not plagiarized but there's a whole lot of common ground material in there because that's the medium that's the uh, the, the genre right do you think J.R.R. Tolkien somehow invented the orc there's a lot of argument as to that he was the first one to put orcs in in concept into a novel or story but there's you know, material prior to that, goblins and what have you, that goes back to mythological times. And it's just a matter of re re rewriting it, repackaging it in a new and different method or uh, approach. And yet it's still McDonald's. You know, the hamburger is the hamburger is the hamburger. I don't care if it's a Wendy's hamburger or a Burger King hamburger, it's still a hamburger. Who invented the hamburger, right? Well, some guy in, in, in England, from what everybody says. Well, then why doesn't all these companies playing, paying his family, uh, you know, uh, some fees for the right to use the term hamburger? Because it's not considered plagiarism. Just saying. So, when I look at these things, I go and I thought, these are great. And I, I keep them somewhat from nostalgia purposes uh, without a doubt. And other reasons, because uh, there's still a lot of good material in here. And once in a blue moon back back before everything went into storage you know I haven't seen some of this stuff in 15 15 20 years and in part because the wife and I moved several times back in the day some of this got boxed up the boxes always came with us but there was just no reason to unpack them and then they got stored at my parents house for a long period of time and some of them migrated from the attic where they were stored to the to the barn and got destroyed which I I do, do not know how that happened who did it and I, it's it doesn't matter now you'll hear me gripe about that probably to the day I die so right one of the this was a loose page by the way I did not tear it off it was already loose this is a tournament request form so if your group or your uh, your club 
or just you and your friends or just you uh, know that you're going to have a local convention coming up at the time uh, you would take this request form and you would follow the instruction fill out and get informations for things uh, to set up and so they could run ads in the upcoming issues and here's the tournament request form and this would get you a package uh, a support package from the club where they would give you some prizes they would give you uh, material to work with potentially even adventure material that you were supposed to present uh, the the forms needed for players who are members to come along it had to show they'd have to show their their ID and their ID's got a code number on the back and that code number would allow them to uh, fill out the form and it show that you participated and they would then mail it back to uh, the people at the network who took care of things. Let's send this form to the RPGA network PO Box 515 Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. So right there, right there, right. So I don't know, you know, if I honestly can't tell you if this is still operating in some form or another. I honestly do not know. I kind of wish I did, but I don't. And as you can see, this is March 40, issue 40. And Lord, my, that's what I get for not grabbing my glasses, right? Now I can't read it. March 1988. So I'm, I'm going to say that I, it was in this era. It, it, within a year or two that I joined up. So I didn't join up at the very beginning because uh, that would have been, oh, I don't know, late, late 70, 79, 78, somewhere in there, 80, and I would have been a teenager and my funds would have been drastically limited. But had I had the means, I guarantee you I'd have joined up. And I can't 100% say that exactly how early I did. I know I have issue 40 and every one of these issues came to me through being a member of the club so you know like I said stack after stack after stack of these things and you figure if we got four a year ten years is forty of these things so I know I got at least forty of these things sticking around they go up into the hundred count I haven't gone out of my way to figure out exactly how big but and I know that there there's some more I still have some more of these sitting somewhere in the garage because I saw them here the other day. That is one heck of a stack, right? I'm just seeing some good stuff. So when we look at things, you know, here's July of 90, uh, issue 97, Champion of the Living City, Champion of the Games, notes from headquarters, the Living City, a short one-off set in the Living City. The Hands of Mercy Children's Hospital and Orphanage, overseen by Drow? Good lord. Really? I don't remember reading that one. Into the Dark. This one must be a Drow based issue. Terror in the Wax Museum. Right. Uh, Weasel Games. U2 Weasel. Weasel uh, Lester Weasel Smith. Uh, Adversaries. This was for Star Wars. Yeah. I got, got that right away when I seen the Celestian over here, right? Uh, Star Wars New Republic campaign adversaries. Your tax dollars at work. Uh, yeah, second edition AD&D game adventures for first to third level PCs. Interesting. You want to be tax collectors? I wonder how, how, how twisted would that particular one-off be, right? Just saying. Going, going, gone. The Living Galaxy give your planet a little atmosphere, a little bits on, and ad, you know, uh, uh, ad, advice on how to spice things up or to make things a little more realistic or add uh, realism to your game. And does this not look common to what we see today in videos and, and uh, entries into people's websites and logs and blogs and so on and so forth? So here we are again to the classifieds. You know, for sale, a wide variety of role-playing modules, supplements, and magazines for a complete list in a business size envelope with 52 cents postage to Bill Briarton of Old Colony Drive, Upper Marlboro, Maryland. So I want you to do that. You guys get on that right now and send him a letter see if he's still around. Pen Pals. I'm looking for Pen Pals. 
gamers who like AD&D game or anyone interested in, in submarine warfare, right? Brian D Dominic, 9 North Wind Circle, Lydiard, Connecticut. Submarine warfare. Now that's a game, or that that's a war game. Uh, there's several of those that were put out. Uh, I didn't get into the to the naval tabletop war games, but they're quite interesting, and they have some awesome lead miniatures to go with them. So, in the, in a short, there you have it. My magazine collection, I guess. My membership, my old, now defunct membership to the RPGA, and a lot of useful material. I'm told that you can get a lot of this stuff nowadays free uh, off the internet. Uh, you can probably get PDF versions of it, I'm sure, and in some cases entire CDs loaded with them. I know that some of this stuff, this stuff not particularly, but Dungeon and Dragon magazine shows up in occasion at my local game store uh, as uh, used goods, so pre-owned, and they can be five to ten bucks a, uh, a, pay, uh, a magazine. So there's still people collecting these things. As for the actual magazines themselves, as far as I know, most of them are now defunct. But I could be wrong. And if I am, please put a comment because people might be interested in either joining or gaining access to them. So until next time, this is Rick the Fat Man.